came in for a coffee, stayed for an hour, 30 minutes into the conversation, it turned into almost an interview. And what attracted me to it is... And we're live from the Bay HQ. Today we have with us Abby Shake, who's the head of platform at Highland Europe. They're a growth stage venture capital firm focused on Europe. So Abby Shake has chosen today to speak about platform and why it's important in VC. If you're joining us for the first time, we're the Bay HQ and we're all about showcasing great British Asian talent across the startup and entrepreneurship world. So Abby Shake, why did you pick this topic? Why is platform some you feel so strongly about. First of all, thank you for having me. Um, really great to just talk about this kind of stuff. It's been a while since I've uh, had a platform like on a podcast to discuss it. But I, so I'm head of platform at Highland Europe, and it's uh, a unique role in the VC industry that is both well known and not well known. I think everybody kind of knows somebody or is aware of some offering from a firm, but. But if you were to be pressed on what we do, it's fairly unknown. There was even some press recently of where you know these roles are unnecessary or something to that effect and caused quite a buzz across many firms who maybe didn't agree or thought it was a strange one. So yeah, I wanted to just talk about it because it's for me, it's a fascinating delve into uh, new endeavors of how technology and how industry are evolving. and. Yeah, that's uh, that's just a, a cool thing to, to learn about, especially if you're one of those people out there wondering how you break into new industries and you're not totally sure what you could do for, for say, a VC firm. And this is a, a good example of it. So what does that platform role entail like on a day-to-day basis? Or I'm guessing you probably don't have a normal day-to-day, but what kind of responsibilities do you have? Yeah, yeah I don't. Uh, it, it will vary depending on the firm. And that's kind of the funny thing. So if you're a salesperson at a technology company selling to enterprise companies or to whomever, you kind of know what you're going to do from one company to the next to the next. And yes, things will change, but the 75% of your life is going to be your prospecting, your sales meetings, your demos, your negotiations. The platform role is very funny because it's not the same for every firm. So prior to this job, I worked at a different firm and the platform role was called Portfolio Growth. There was a team of up to 12 people at some point doing a various amount of things from revenue operations guidance to talent to business development. Um, Business development was what I did, and that was much more finding customers for our portfolio companies, making inroads to C-level executives across, for me, the European landscape, but for our team, just anybody in the global 2000. Where I'm at now at Highland Europe doing platform, I'm the first person in this role for the firm and it's a really, really long list of things to try to do with a wide remit and a green field to do it. And I'll stop using various tech jargon soon. Uh, what Basically what I do is there's two key factors for all of our companies that they need help with, and that's the expert network. So how do I find really, really smart people who've done really great things, who can advise a first-time founder, uh, and the CFO doing something for the first time, um, or somebody who's just got an open question on what the best path forward could be. Um, be surprised how often that comes up and how important it is. The other one is, is the talent network and working really closely with the executive recruitment teams across Europe uh, and in the US for that matter, and helping them match to the right companies for the right roles. So as a company needs a new CFO, they can come to us. We can help them find the person in the network who's either going to help them or fill that role. Uh, And those are the first two kind of more important things. After that, it is a very long tail of tons of stuff from helping with the events, with our events professional, from helping with the marketing that we're going to do and working with our PR firm, to organizing solutions that we use for DD and helping the investors just get better at investing. So here platform is going to just be a, a, an array of madness and it'll most likely become more evident as to what's best for us and what the open opportunities are and what is working well and what isn't. Um, but I've been here for three months. So this is my second role in VC. And I can say that I've learned a lot in the first role and now I'm continuing to learn constantly. What attracted you to this role? Like what made you want to go down the platform path? And so you said before, your previous company is called something different. 
but obviously you've chosen to come here and set up the platform section for Highland. What attracted you to that? Well, I en- I entered the VC industry entirely out of a recruiter. So I was I had a cursory awareness of what platform was because my my role that I uh, was in at Dropbox before I joined the VC industry was a business development role, specifically partnerships and trying to acquire as many new customers to Dropbox through whatever sort of business development discounts we could. The big thing I did there was like working with American Express, working with um, JCB, working with MasterCard, working with Visa, working with whatever else and getting discounts. So if you're ever on AmericanExpress.com, if you have a card, you'll see a Dropbox discount. That was something that I worked on. Um, what we found too is that a lot of VCs came to us and they said, hey, we want to get a discount for our portfolio companies. We're going to use Dropbox for collaboration. So I said, great, I'll, I'll work with you on that. That's just how I became aware of the role. I got introduced to a recruiter through LinkedIn who was looking to fill this role at a different firm. Um, and then in talking to them and getting presented with opportunities, I ended up working in platform or portfolio growth at that company. It was called Sapphire Ventures. Um, spending some time there, learning the ropes, understanding the VC industry is totally different than even an operator uh, at a company that's VC backed. So, so much of the jargon, so much of the efforts, so much of the focus is going to change. So it took me a while to just spin up on that. And then when this role came on, it was actually uh, introduced via a British Asian connection. Um, through friends of friends who said, hey, Highland Europe is actually looking for someone to do the same kind of role. It was sort of what my boss's boss did at Sapphire. And uh, they just wanted some advice and some guidance because they were having some trouble with landing the right person. So came in for a coffee, stayed for an hour, 30 minutes into the conversation, it turned into almost an interview. And what attracted me to it is the builder in me said, hey, this is a really cool opportunity to put a stamp on how a firm does their value add work. So these investors are great. These companies are amazing. Um, They're all doing things in a non-scalable sort of uh, word of mouth way. And I wanted to come in and add that uh, institutional rigor that I had at bigger companies when I worked as an operator. Um, not that they couldn't do that themselves. And I firmly believe everybody at this particular company could easily do a lot of what I do, but an investor in today's industry wants to be an investor first and an operator and an effortful, um, guider second, not in a bad way. Um, but much more because, uh, that's just what they're paid to do and what their efforts are. And so a person like me comes in to be able to take a lot of the ownership of things that maybe they don't want to do. You hear a lot from different founders who complain about their VCs not helping them or the VCs not doing enough. And it's interesting, I think, because like you said, it's it's always hard because everybody's in their own bubble. So they don't necessarily see that the investors are, they've got so many other things to do that maybe they don't have time to be the role that you're doing for them. But at the same time, that's a big part of the value add that you can offer founders, right? As, a, as Highland, right? And especially when it comes to, say, very hot rounds where every VC wants a part of this company it's a way for you guys to differentiate yourselves, right? And have you found that in conversations, do you find that when you're talking to people who just joined the portfolio for the first time, for example, how is that relationship with you? Do, they, do you find they really are happy to have you and do they understand the relationship well? I mean, it's a flip a coin as to whether or not they've had somebody in the earlier stages. We're growth stage, so we're series B onwards. Chances are if you've invested with somebody, um, and you, or someone had invested in you rather, and they had a platform team, you might have interacted with someone like me. The offering of platform is going to shift quite differently across the stages. You don't get a lot of people in my level of investing that do a lot of like the CEO coaching all the time or helping understand basic company setup stuff or organizing the first ever hires of really key functional roles that all sort of happens before you get to me when you're at me you're you're solving more complicated and tricky problems and you're looking for that fractional um, success factor that next leader the CISO not the CIO the VP of FP&A not just a CFO and so now your company is starting to expand and a lot of these founders have also been 
heads down in this stuff for so long um, that they will take kind of any help they can get in that way. So they're quite excited when they have the opportunity to talk to someone like me and I can just say, tell me what your problems are. Tell me what you're looking forward to. Hey, you're releasing a new product. Do you want to talk to a product expert who can just make sure that everything is aligned the way you want to do that from a PM perspective, from an engineering perspective, from a resources perspective? Um, I think if people say that their investors aren't doing a lot for them, um, I would caution that in saying the first thing is the money that they give you is a lot. Um, it might not feel a lot because we're in a very like, there's a lot of VC firms and a lot of money, quote unquote. But that money is not a small thing because it's not their money. Uh, it's their LPs money and their fiduciary committee and on the hook to those LPs is not a small thing that you can kind of like have wanton abandon with, abandonment with. Um, so I caution everybody saying, though, my investors don't do a lot. The investors are are effectively spending someone else's money on you and made a big bet. But two, um, we don't get a chance to just do things for our companies proactively because we might know what they need but we also really need to talk to you and understand what it is that you're looking for how you feel about what's coming up what your plans are in the next year and none of us are mind readers and i think it's really important to know that every good relationship not even in investing but personally speaking has a strong communication underlying you know i i um i'm a new father and I met my wife in 2020. So we've had this really whirlwind experience where we met in January 2020. We were engaged in February 2021. We had our first child in November 2022. So the only way we could have survived the way we have is, is by a constant communication, um, openness to that discussion, asking what each other needs. Because we didn't have years of getting to know each other before bringing a new a new life into this world. Um, and that that goes into business as well. It's I never spend a day heads down, locked in a room, typing away, figuring out things without asking, is this the right direction? Is this what you need? You know, you and I met because one of my companies needs a little bit of guidance. I didn't just say to them, here's your person, go off and have fun. I I went back and forth. We discussed how are these profiles? Do they fit what you're looking for? Do you think it'd be a valuable discussion? And then have those conversations. It's more resource intensive. And it takes longer to get the thing done. But I would also argue that we're not in that hyper, hyper, hyper growth at all costs mentality anymore. And thoughtful, meaningful changes and, and efforts are way more valuable to everybody. Um, and I think we've learned our lesson a little bit from a 2021, 2022 perspective that there's no way that we'll survive as an industry in technology and in VC and everything if we consistently overreach the whole time. Sorry, long answer to a short question. No, no, it was really interesting. And before you came into VC, you would have obviously had your own preconceived notions of what companies would need potentially and what they might be asking for. And now you've been in this role, and as you said, so much is about communication, understanding what businesses need. Is it that maybe surprised you about what, say, companies at the growth stage need or they're looking for that maybe you wouldn't have thought that or you didn't realize how important it was? Yeah, yeah, fully. I think you'd be surprised at how vulnerable a CEO can be. And this is a person whose company is valued in the hundreds of millions, who's got, in, in the parlance of an average individual, they are quote unquote, they've made it in a way, you know, but they know they haven't. And if you take a second to think about it, you know, they haven't either because <clears throat> valuations are a sticky thing in some ways, but then they can all of a sudden slip away. Um, I was, I was never really shocked by what someone asked me, but I was perhaps an imposter syndrome a little bit, which is a natural thing, especially as like a child of immigrants growing up in a, where I'm from in the U S is not very diverse. There's a lot of imposter syndrome. If I go and do the work and I put a lot of effort in to learn exactly what I need to learn, to tell you, to teach you, to guide you on a decision you're going to make, or I find that that great person that I know is killer. I'm still very worried about the approval. And I think they're the same way. And so I was very fascinated that they listened to me at first, but then I realized that the two of us were, um, and this is the founder, but included investor and whomever else here, we're all sort of feeling around in the dark. We got a sense of what the room looks like, but 
we haven't yet found the light switch that has eliminated everything for us. And that's really what a lot of our relationships are. It's how can you help me shed some light on this very murky, super specific, perhaps I'm one of five people in the world who ever have had to experience this before topic. Hey everyone, I hope you're enjoying this episode so far. The Bay HQ has a podcast, but we're so much more than that. So if you want to find out about all of the events we've got going on, all the different ways you can meet each other, as well as resources to help you build the business of your dreams, then check out the link in the show notes, sign up to our newsletter, where you get a weekly roundup, which we like to call the Bay Letter, that will keep you in the loop. If you want to help us out, the best thing you can possibly do is sign up to our newsletter and share it with your friends. So that's enough from me now. Let's get back to the show. I think what's interesting there too is like the partnership element of that because so much of that based on trust, right? Because as you said, if a CEO to be vulnerable and say, look, I don't know what I'm doing here or I don't know this specific area and I'm worried that's going to cause these problems, then if they're worried about their investor pulling out or the investor, oh, actually, this person's incapable. But from your role, you can build that trust with them. And I think that's a really important part of that role too. So how have you been able to do that? How have you been able to build the trust of the CEOs to know that it's okay for them to admit they need help and that you're willing and able to do that? I think our investors are the ones who have the most credit there because they build that trust before the deal happens. Because it's it's really easy to view what an investment looks like from a transactional perspective. I am paying you a bunch of money and you're going to go build a great company and I get to be part of your success. What's really happening is a sales transaction is occurring. So the investor is saying, I want to give you a bunch of money, but I want to also own a part of this thing that is your baby, if you will. And that takes a lot of trust. Ultimately, no good entrepreneur sort of willy nilly sells their shares and says, I don't really care who takes this money, um, this, this equity rather, and I will take all their money. And those who do that probably find themselves struggling with a really confusing cap table and a lot of influence that they don't want. Um, so that thoughtful perspective is really important. It's, it's from the, the, you know, day one of this thing. If you read this really interesting book called The Power Law, which uh, it sort of outlines the history of venture capital from the early semiconductor days till even into like Uber and stuff like that. Um, you'll notice that there is a lot of that trust that occurs at the investor level. When they come to me, they know the firm, they trust the firm, they like the firm. Um, the trust that I build in them is one of an open ear, another open ear that's not on their board, that's not perhaps somebody who has um, any sort of like perceived power of influence because I'm the value add person. So I'm not going to be sitting in on a board meeting with them necessarily. Um, what they can get from me is a sort of wide network and array, um, but it's not an automatic transaction of, of trust. You know, they, I do have to earn that. And I earn that really truly by just being kind of an open honest and, and a collaborative person and just takes time with all the senior level exec uh, relationships I had at the global 2000 in my previous role too. It was that too. It took like six months of regular conversations of just talking about stuff, about sharing some insights that we had about gleaning information from what they were saying to try to help them solve problems without any sort of vested interest in the solution to, to earn a bit of trust. And even then, Trust is a very funny thing because much like British weather can go away really fast and you have to maintain it and you have to nurture it in that way. And um, I do find that our founders, at least at Highland Europe, really, really trust the firm to help um, and really like their investors. And so my job is way easier that way because I'm coming from a really, really great culture of investors, uh, which is which is great for me. And I'm cheating the game a little bit that way. What do you enjoy most about working in platform and also what you're most excited about building in the future what i'm most excited about i th i would want i would say that the thing i like about platform is that it's such a new endeavor there's not a lot of technology or solutions or creative ideas that have been really truly battle tested and we have this massive group of vc platform people that we all interact and we're all throwing really interesting ideas 
And I found that with the freedom of a head of platform role that I have, I'm starting to now interact with them a lot more and glean more ideas and work with them closely and come up with solutions that harkens back to my solutions architect days when I could take a customer problem and navigate our products such that the problem made sense within the confines of what we were selling. So I'm really excited by the fact that like I get a chance to flex on new technology and, and make it work for me. I also really like the um, the industry's acceptance of this kind of role. I didn't know that you know Sequoia had some layoffs in their talent division. If you read into the tea leaves of it, I think the people were, were perhaps just too generalist and they needed more specialist talent people. Um, I don't believe that we have... Uh, I honestly don't believe that we have any sort of issues regarding uh, where VC platform sits and whether or not we'll be a, a valuable asset in VC. I think people writing articles about whether or not we're useful or not um, for clickbaity, for the clickbaity nature of it. I think you're kind of missing the greater point here, which is as every industry grows, you know, back in the day, the tech industry was always engineers, tons of engineers, maybe like a professional CEO. And now you have marketing, you have social media, you have the product managers, you have the product engineers, you have secure, like where are these massive companies that when you start to hire for specific roles, you're like, that's so specific that five years ago would that role have never been necessary at this company. And the VC industry is the same. And yeah, we, we grew pretty big, I think in the last couple of years as an industry. Um, and there will be some consolidation. There always is with these types of things, but this is innovation. And I'm fascinated to see in five years what that further innovation will look like. And if it's not platform, it's going to be something else. Like we're going to have, you know, VC industries with crazy good data engineers that are just crunching massive amounts of data to do great models that do some AI efforts to help solve whether or not our companies need this, this, or this in the next five years. Like that's going to be some really fascinating stuff, I think. So thanks so much for coming on today, Abhishek. I've learned a lot about platform and hopefully our listeners have learned a lot too. So I'm going to move to a quick five questions now. So the first one is who are three British Asians working in the space you'd love to shout out that you think are doing incredible work yeah absolutely um the i'm gonna cheat a little bit so sorry in advance um the first one is the gentleman who introduced me to highland europe um his name's gopi he is a good friend of mine he's um, an ir guy in the industry he worked at balderton worked at notion super great looking um, to do really great things. So um, thanks to him. The other one is Gudge, who is one of our partners here, who actually was the person I was introduced to, um, who helped me slide into this particularly great role. Um, so both of those guys, that's kind of a cheat because they're kind of one relationship that's super important to me. <laughs> um, the other one is a really, really great investor named Danica. She's at Cherry Ventures. Uh, we went to college together. She's astounding and cool and really fascinating as um, an investor and she is doing great things. So um, just a shout out to her because uh, I really appreciate all the work she does. And the last one is the the proper actual cheat because it's the fourth, but it's like a half person is my daughter, uh, Lakshmi. She's a tiny little brand new British Asian. Um, and I'm fascinated to see what she brings to the world. And she's doing a lot of really fascinating things like teething and dancing for the first time. So uh, yeah, that's, that's my, uh, my, for unfortunately <laughs> British Asians. Next question is if people want to like learn more about you, more about Highland, where should they go to? Yeah, of course. Um, our website's the best place, highlandeurope.com. Um, we, we post a lot of really interesting things there. There's a profile of me done by our PR firm, which is great. That just outlines a little bit. Um, I'm also just kind of an avid like writer about this new fatherhood thing that I have and um, so check out LinkedIn. Um, my LinkedIn posts are silly and um, useless, but fun for me to write. Um, and then Highland Europe, yeah, just check out our website. Check out our LinkedIn, where we have some really great companies that have come into the portfolio recently. Shout out to Nothing Tech, who provided these great headphones, one of our newest portfolio companies. Um, and and yeah, I'm always happy to connect with people if they wanted to chat more. And next one is, if people listening right now might be able to help you or help Highland in some way. What could they do to help you? Yeah, <clears throat> if you're a really good, and I, re I mean really good, experienced expert in something, if you've done some, forgive the Californian parlance, some gnarly stuff that has taught you an immense amount of um, information about how to solve crazy problems, like come to me. I want to put you in front of people. Um, I want you to talk to our founders if you guys have some great relationship and you've helped them further on and become an advisor and all like happy days for all of us. 
Um, if you're a stellar C-level person in the industry, a SaaS industry or consumer industry, whatever, come my way if you're looking for another thing. Um, we do some really great talent and stuff. Um, and then also, if you're um, doing anything like this, if you're helping VC firms, you're helping startups in a way. I met this really great guy at a pub once who just, um, he does that VC BD thing, but he does it at his own company. It's just great to talk to him because I, we shared a lot of war stories. And then, you know, he's a really, really fascinating scaling individual that I was like, okay, this is a fun person to have met. So yeah, I'm very open to meeting a lot of people. Um, I used to host a podcast where literally that was all I did is just meet random people and ask some strange questions. So uh, that's a bit of my MO. So thank you again so much for coming on. Have you got any final words for the audience? No, absolutely not. I appreciate the time. It's been really great. I think I've talked too much. So apologies. I hope that my tones were not too uh, sleep inducing to everybody. And uh, yeah, looking forward to, to being part of the greater ecosystem. Hello, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for listening. It means a huge amount to us. And we don't think you realize how important you are. Because if you subscribe to our YouTube channel, if you leave us a five-star review, it makes a world of difference. And if you believe in what we're trying to do here, to inspire, connect and guide the next generation of British Asians, if you do those things, you can help us achieve that mission and you can help us make a bigger impact. And by doing that, it means we can get bigger guests, we can host more events, we can do more for the community. So you can play a huge part. So thank you so much for supporting us.